How many are just so thankful, especially in this season, it's Christmas season, I'm especially thankful that we have such a loving Father, our God in heaven. He loves us so much that in this Christmas season, what this is all about reminds us that he gave his one and only son to us. Christmas was the moment that the plan of God from the beginning of time began to unfold. Where God said, I'm gonna send my son so I can save all of us, so that he can have a relationship with you and I, so that you can be free from pain, you can be free from the hurt, you can be free and have a brand new start, you can be forgiven of your sins and have eternal life. That's what this season's all about. How many are thankful that Jesus came and sacrificed his life so that we can have a new beginning? He did it for you and I. And I want to encourage you, if you're going through a difficult season right now in life, and maybe Christmas season is hard for you. Maybe it, 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 it's a reminder, maybe of some of the difficult times in your life. Maybe the family's not all together right now. Maybe it's hard to make ends meet. I just want to remind you that even in the storm, God is with you. Even in the valley, he's walking beside you. Even in the dark times, you can have this hope. You can stand on this one thing, that God will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has a good plan for you. And everything you feel like that's falling apart, you can trust God. Put it in his hands. And I believe it's all going to turn out for good in his name. How many believe that this morning? He has a good plan for you. Today, I believe God has a word for us. I believe God is going to speak very clearly to us. And if this is your first time, I want you to know you're in the right place today. You're, you're truly in the right place. God loves you and he has a plan for you. Really quick, just by show of hands, how many of if this is your first time here at, at the Wayward Outreach today? Just slip your hand up. I just want to say hi. Welcome. Welcome, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome. We love you. And, you know, I believe God has a word for us today. Why don't we do this? Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Let's go before the Lord. God, this morning, we're ready to hear from you. We're not here to hear uh, some man-made opinions or some fancy words that, God, that, that, mean, that comes to nothing. Lord, what we want to hear is your word. We need your power. God, today there's someone here that's depressed. They need your joy. God, there's someone that's in here that's going through one of the most ancient, anxious seasons of their life. They need your peace today. There's some that are in here today that don't know which way to go. They're confused. God, right now we need your divine direction. We need your clarity. So God, I pray today you would speak very clearly to our hearts. Our eyes, our ears are open to you, Lord. So speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. And we all say amen, amen, and amen. You may be seated. Tell your neighbor on your way down, say, man, you're looking good today. Hallelujah. Man. And just tell them, thank you. Wow. Thank you. Hey Amen. Well, today's message, we're continuing in the Abundant Life series. Uh, my name is Pastor Christian. I'm the campus pastor here at Hallmark Campus. And I want to give a shout out to our pastor, Pastor Marco. He is actually preaching at our LA campus right now. Shout out to Pastor Marco. So welcome everybody who's here today and everybody that's tuning in online. Welcome to service. I believe God has an awesome word for you. Um, we, we, it's so great to see we're sending a team out right now to Uganda. They're going to be leaving tonight. And we have over 100 churches in Uganda that are going to receive an impartation of revival and discipleship. And actually, we just had a team of over 30 young adults come back from Tijuana, Mexico. Shout out to the young adults. They visited our, our TJ campus this weekend and we're there loving on people and taking care of them. Today, as we continue in the Abundant Life series, the message of today's sermon is receiving the goodness of God. Someone say, I receive the goodness of God. You know, of all the things that God created in this world, he says that you are his masterpiece. And God has created a lot of cool things, beautiful things. He's created the heavens, the earth, the stars. 
He created these beautiful mountains. He created these beautiful sunset skies. Have you ever driven home and just admired the sunset and saw how wonderful and how beautiful God is? And he created all of these things with one word. He said, let there be, boom, and it existed. And every day he paints with his beautiful, his hand, he paints a new sky for us. And, and every day there's something new. Nothing in this world can match how wonderful God is. Look at this, look at this field here. This is a field of, of some, uh, I, don't, I forgot what those flowers are called, but they're red and it's pretty. That's in China somewhere. Look at these mountains. These are, look at how beautiful this lake is here. God made this with his words. He didn't even have to get his hands involved. He just spoke them and they existed. Look at this beautiful canyon. Look at this, how gorgeous this looks. God created this and imagined this and spoke these things into existence. Look at these beautiful, these are called the Rainbow Mountains. These are also in China. China's got some beautiful stuff. Look at, these actually exist. This is not an AI picture. This is a real picture. Look at now the stars in the sky. Look at how big and vast these are. God created all of these with one word. These stars burn. These stars are magnificent. They're huge. There's so much power. Some of these stars are bigger than the sun. A million suns could probably fit in some of these stars. They're massive. They're ginormous. There's billions upon billions of galaxies all throughout our universe that God created with one spoken word. And of all of these beautiful things that God created, he said, my masterpiece is you. You're my masterpiece. Look how beautiful and magnificent these things are, yet you are his masterpiece. You're his best work. You know, artists and creators, people that paint for a living or create for a living, they have a lot of things that they love they've created, but there's one thing, there's one piece, there's one work that defines their career forever, and that's the piece that's called the masterpiece. And of all the things that God has created, he said, you're my masterpiece. You're my favorite. You're my best work. And if God has called you his masterpiece, if God has called you his best work, then why do we treat ourselves like we have no value? Why do we look in the mirror and see no value. And sometimes we've even called ourselves trash. We've even saw worthlessness. We look in the mirror and we think we're good for nothing. And how many times have we said that about ourselves or felt that or thought that in our own mind? I'm guilty of that same thought as well. I can't amount to it. I can't do it. I'm not good enough. I'll never be able to. All these lies from the enemy. Yet God in all of his wonderful creations has said, no, you're my masterpiece. You're my best work. It says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew. Someone say anew. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. Today, we're going to learn about this good thing, this goodness of God. We're going to learn about how God sees us and how our response should be towards his view to us. We're gonna learn about this good life that God promises his, good, his children. I'm gonna start with point number one is this. You are God's treasure. Someone say, I am God's treasure. It says in, as I look through verses and I look through scriptures, it's interesting how many times this actually comes up. All throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament, it's all over scripture. It's like God's trying to get us a clear message. You are my treasure. I value you. But isn't it crazy that even though God is shouting and he's writing and he's screaming that towards us and he's letting us know that sometimes we hear the voice of the enemy louder that we think we're not valued by God. He doesn't love me. He doesn't see me. He doesn't care for me. These are all lies from the enemy. And God shows us over and over and over again in scripture that we are actually a prized possession to God. We are his special possession. Look at James 1.18. It says, he chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we out of all creation became his prized possessions. Jeremiah 51.19 says he is the creator of everything that exists, including his people, his own special 
possession. 1 Peter 2.8 says, but God chose you to be his people. You are royal priests. You are a holy nation. You are God's special treasure. Are you getting the message? God is saying this over and over and over again. And if you're not convinced, here's another scripture. Deuteronomy 7, 6. For you are a holy people who belong to the Lord your God. Of all the people on earth, the Lord your God has chosen you to be his own special treasure. You are valuable to the Lord. Are you seeing this? Are you hearing the voice of God today? Maybe you came in here super discouraged, feeling like you mean nothing to God, like you're not seen to the Lord, like you have no purpose in life. This is a lie from the enemy. You have value, you have purpose, regardless of what you've went through, regardless of the mistakes you've made, regardless of all the things you've done, God has a plan and a purpose for you and you are valuable to him. You are a prized possession. You are his treasure. Someone say, I am God's treasure. So this makes me think, if God tells us this over and over and over again, I wonder, if we're his prized possession, what will he withhold from us? Nothing. What will he keep, what what blessings will he keep from you? Nothing. What, 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 What good things will he withhold from you? He won't withhold anything good because you're the most valuable thing to the Lord. You are prized possession to God. You're his masterpiece. You're the head and not the tail. You have value to the Lord. What will he withhold from you? He is a good God. See, today it's it's crazy that we have to be convinced sometimes that we can receive a good thing from God. Sometimes all we think we receive from the Lord is, is evil, is bad things, but But the reality is God has only good to give to us. God has a good thing to give to you. God is blessing. God is restoration. God is forgiveness. God is a new spirit, a new heart. God is a new mindset. God is a future for you. And if we would just understand this, we would realize that God has some good things for me. And I'm ready to receive those today. How many are ready to receive the good things that God has for you? There's good for us. And God has it. You're precious to the Lord. So how can he withhold anything from us if we're his prized possession? Point number two. Not only do we see over and over in scripture that we are his treasure, but point two is just as important. And and I want to explain this really quick. I want to preface by saying that what we see over and over in scripture is that it's not outside things that are a treasure, but the reality is Jesus is our treasure. So many times we got our mind fixed on what Jesus can do for us rather than him himself. Some of us have fallen more in love with God's creation than the creator himself. Some of us have, have, have began to idolize the good things that God gives us rather than glorifying God on the throne of our hearts. See, if you want to know what the one, number one goal in life, the number one thing to have, the secret in life, the number one thing that's going to fulfill your needs, is going to make you whole and happy. It's not going to be how much money you make. It's not going to be how nice your clothes look. It's not going to be the status or the fame you achieve. It's not going to be your accolades or your accomplishments. The number one thing in life that you need to aspire to chase after and to have is Jesus himself, is a relationship with the creator of the universe, is to be one with him, is to know him closer and closer closer. See, this message isn't about what Jesus can get for you. This message is about what Jesus has done for you. This message is about that Jesus died on the cross to have a relationship with you. And the greatest thing you can have in this world is a relationship with the creator of the heavens. He wants a relationship with you. How do I know that? Because he sent his son Jesus on the cross so that he can bridge the gap between me, a filthy sinner, and God, all perfect and almighty. He's made me pure, he's made me whole, he's redeemed me, he's forgiven me of my sins so that I can now have a relationship with him. God set it up, God did it for me. That's how much he values you and I, that he would do it for us. How many are thankful that we have a loving father that cares for you and values you? You're his masterpiece, you're not trash in the eyes of God, you're valuable to the Lord. 
Jesus is our treasure. It's Jesus himself. It's more than money, more than status, more than fame. Look at Lamentations uh, uh, chapter 3, verse 24. Scripture says, I say to myself, that's a good thing sometimes we've got to talk to ourselves. You ever had to preach to yourself at times? I've had to do it. Sometimes you got to not wait for Sunday morning to get a good encouraging message. Sometimes you got to wake up Monday morning. Sometimes you got to be on Wednesday afternoon. Look yourself in the mirror and just preach and just tell yourself, I'm preaching. I got the word in me. I'm going to speak it. I don't got to wait for Sunday for some pastor to pep talk me. I got the word living inside of me. I got the power of God living in my bones. I do not have to wait. God is with me and I can preach and say to myself some good things. I believe it and I'm going to speak it in Jesus' name. This is what he said to himself. This is what the scripture says. The Lord is my inheritance. Therefore, I will hope in him. Another scripture, another version says, I say to myself, the Lord is everything I will ever need. So I will put my hope in him. Sometimes the devil wants to trick you and wants you to think that you need God plus something. The devil wants you to think that you could sprinkle God on your life like a Sunday. God's a little cherry on top of our our lifestyle. And that's the enemy's plan. He's like, if I can get them to think that God is just a piece of the puzzle, then then I have accomplished my, my, my plan in their life. But no, the reality is God isn't a piece of the puzzle. He's everything. He becomes our core. He becomes the whole picture. He is all the pieces of the puzzle. He is everything in your, in your marriage. He becomes everything in your finances. He becomes everything in your health. He becomes everything in your goals in life. He becomes everything in your sanity. God is the full picture. Jesus is the full puzzle piece. You don't need another answer. Jesus is the answer. He is our inheritance. He is everything that we need. Is there anybody in here that desires and loves Jesus in this place today? He's all that we need. He's everything and more. The sooner we realize this, that Jesus is not a means to an end but that he is the beginning and the end in our lives. In that moment, we'll begin walking in this abundant life that Jesus has promised you. He is everything and more. He's all that you need. Nothing matters more than Jesus. Look at Philippians 3, verse 7 and 8. It says, I once thought these things were valuable. This is Paul talking, and what he's speaking of, where he has these if you go on in the, in, the, in the chapter, you'll see he lists some of the accolades, how, how, how rigorous he was in living the lifestyle, living according to the law, his bloodline, his, 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 his lineage and his fame and his status, all the things he had. He once thought these things valuable. And, and at that time they were, they were sought after. These were the kinds of guys you wanted to be at that time. They had it all. And maybe we see people in our lifestyle or on Instagram or on TV, it seems like they got it all. They got the fame, they got the looks, they got the money, they got the joy, they got the friends, they got everything. And these are all things we think are valuable. And they do, they, they, are, they do have value. But what Paul's saying here is so profound. He's saying, I used to think these things were valuable. And then he says, but now... I consider them worthless. Why? Why are the things that were so grand, so big, so valuable, why are they worthless now? Because of what Christ has done. What good, the Bible says, is to profit the world and lose your soul. What good is it to gain everything in this world, to have all of these things that seem valuable, yet lose your soul? When you think about it, When you put some perspective on it, the reality is all of the fame, all of the money, all of the good things in this world are worthless in comparison to your relationship with Jesus Christ. The most valuable thing you will ever have in your life is your relationship with God. It's Jesus himself. It says, yes, verse 8, yes, everything else, everything Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Everything else. I've come to love and know Jesus so much. This is what he's saying. 
that I realized that everything I once valued before could do nothing for me. They're worthless because I've come to know the one who can give me peace, who can save me, who can fill every void in my heart, who could set me free from my addiction, who could forgive me of the, the, the dirty sins I've committed, who can give me a purpose in life and create a future for me. I've come to realize all this searching I was doing in the money and the fame and all these things in the drugs and the relationships and the sleeping around, all these things I've been doing, I've realized this, that I was searching for an answer, but the answer has been a person and his name is Jesus. He is the way, he is the truth, and he is the life that I've been looking for. Jesus is our inheritance. He's everything that we need he is all of it and more I hope we're getting this and I'm drilling this home because I think it's important that we, we realize our own efforts and achievements they because they're worthless when compared to the value of knowing who Jesus is that doesn't when you tip the scales Jesus is more valuable true abundance comes when we come to know and live for Jesus so I have a question for you where is your heart? Who is your devotion? Who does your devotion belong to? Who in your life would you say is your treasure? Or what in your life? This is the most valuable thing to me. What is that? And the reality is, Everybody has been here, all of us, including me on the stage, we have all been at this place where we've come to a crossroads and we've had to decide if what's most valuable to me, gonna, is that going to be surrendered to Jesus? Or am I going to hold on to it? You know, the Bible says this, it's an interesting scripture, and I've heard this scripture being taught by other preachers and pastors, uh, it, you know, online or different places, and I've always heard this, this scripture preached backwards. And, and God just revealed to me, it was interesting, that it's always been preached backwards, and I'm realizing what it actually says. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 21. The scripture says, we, we know the, the NKJV version, it says, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Let's break this down. Let's slow it down for a second. I've always thought wherever your heart is, there your treasure will follow. What does that mean? Well, whatever I'm in love with the most, then my treasure will follow that. And I think that's true to some extent, but that's not what the scripture is saying. What the scripture actually says is this. For where your treasure is, your heart will begin to follow that. Wherever it is that you're placing what's most valuable to you, your heart will begin to lean in that direction. What, what is most valuable to you? And if what's most valuable to you is in another area, is in a dark place, your heart is going to follow darkness. If what's most valuable to you is in something, is in these achievements, in these accolades, then your heart is going to follow that thing. I got an illustration. I want to. I want to bring up. I, I got some volunteers. Mark and Mia. Let's bring. Let's give Mark and Mia a hand. They have no idea what was about to go down right now. We just asked them like five minutes ago if they would do this. Mark is one of our usher leaders in the building. He's doing an awesome job. Mia is one of our front office uh, accountant uh, ladies. She's just. They're doing an incredible job. Let's give them a hand. Okay. Yeah, right over here. I'm gonna illustrate something really quick. I want you to stand behind this table. You can stand behind that. Look at that. Look at the Christmas tree. Look, it's Christmas came early. Hallelujah. So I got three gifts up here. But these three gifts, you can't have all of them. You can only have one. So you guys have to decide which one you want. Okay, you ready? Who's ready for the first gift? Let's take a look. First gift is, drum roll please. Okay, that was, yeah, not, not a good drum roll, so it's okay. First gift is a brand new Blue Ridge 8-in-1 folding screwdriver with a folding head to compact storage and easy to carry. And it also includes a work light and a flashlight. This is everything you need in one device. Mia, look at that. Doesn't, wouldn't that be just a great, get, no, not really. Mark, what do you think about this one? 
Oh, oh, he said, now it's okay. All right, well. All right, well, you guys have to pick one. I want to see who, who would like what gift more. Okay, so there's that, that gift there. Now I want to see what the second, you want to see what the second gift is? The second gift is this beautiful cup. Ooh, all pink and all girly and looking all cute. Mia, what do you think about this one? Oh, she has too many of those. That means you like these. Mark, I think you will look, do you like this one? Oh, he says it's a favorite color. You guys are surprising me right now. Okay, so Mark, if you had to pick between these two, which one would you pick? This one. Mia, which one would you pick? Wait, am I right or you're right? Wow, okay, that's interesting. Okay, so you kind of, uh, uh, my illustration is not going to work unless you stick to your, uh, your role here. They have no idea, but okay. So check this out. Let's pretend that Mia loves this cup and she's so in love with it that she just wants it so bad and she cannot live without this cup. And let's pretend that Mark was praying for a screwdriver and he's just like, man, I just needed one of these in my car because you just need one of these in your car. It's okay, it's okay. They had no idea. But what we really want to see is what's in this third one. Yeah, see, see what he means? So they're like, nah, nah, I want to see what's in the third one. Oh, we always want to see what's in the third one. So let's see what's in this third one. There's two things in here. One is a jar of manzanilla olives. Wow, come on, so how many want some olives? And number two is another jar of manzanilla olives. You want the third gift? Okay, absolutely not, right? you would probably lean more on one of these two. And it, it's, it's no brainer. You're not going to go with the olives. Now let's do something really quick. Are you guys able to take off your wedding rings for me? Ooh, look at, look at her reaction. She's like, ooh, I don't know. I don't know. Okay, that's okay. Just your, one, or your bracelet. Give me your bracelet. Give me your ring. Give me your watch. Give me, but just look at it. It's valuable to her. It means something to her. Look at it. And this is scary. Now, what if I did this? What if I took what was valuable to them and put it in this gift here? What if I placed it there, something they treasured? Now, if I said you could have only one of these gifts now, you could have the screwdriver, you could have the cup, or you could have this one here, which is where your treasure is sitting. Which one do you want the most? This one. It's a no-brainer. It's no question. This one you'd have to decide. I'm not really sure. But this one, it's a no-brainer. I want what's in this. Why? Because what's valuable to them, where their treasure is, their heart follows that. Now here's the, here's the principle that we can learn from this here. Wherever it is that you place your treasure, your heart will follow that. If you put your treasure in the hands of God, your heart will begin to follow that there. If you place what's valuable to you, what's most important to you, what has the most meaning to you in the hands of God, it's a no-brainer. I know this, I kind of like that. This, I kind of like this. But it's a no-brainer. Those things come to worthlessness when compared to what I put my treasure in. My heart is after God because I put what's valuable to me in his hands. I put the best of my day. I put the best of my resources. I gave him my full heart. I gave him my full life. I gave him my family. I I dedicated my kids to him. I've given them everything. I'm giving God all that I have and I'm putting my treasure in his hands so my heart begins to follow that gift there. Does that make sense? So which one do you want? Are you sure? You don't want the cup? Okay, okay. All right, they did a good job. Let's give them a round of applause. Here you go. They get this gift here. Not only that, Mia, you get this cup that you wanted so bad and Mark, you get the screwdriver that you prayed for. And some olives. Come on, somebody, give them olives too. Hallelujah. Let's give them a round of applause. This is the point. Some of us right now, we have so much desire and attention and affection towards things that do not matter when it comes down to it. And I'm not saying they don't matter as in it's worthless. I'm saying this, in the scope of things, our priorities are all backwards. Why is that? Because we've given our valuables, our treasure, our good things to stuff that comes to nothing at the end of the world, at the end of our lives. We're focused on our jobs. We're focused on our status. We're focused on other things. And God is saying, if you truly want to value your relationship with me, 
practice what I've done. Sacrifice, give everything, put it in my hands. That means give God your relationship. That means give God your job. That means give God your lifestyle. That means give God your mind. This also means give God the best of your day. Some of us have woken up every single day and given the first and the best of our day to Instagram and Facebook. Every day we've given our best to social media. And God is saying, stop giving your best to other things because your heart will begin to follow that. Give your best to me. Give the beginning of your day to me. Give your devotion to me. Give your affection. Give what you value to me and your heart will begin to follow. Put your treasure in God's hands. Is this making sense? So now, point number three, don't withhold from God. It says in Matthew 16, 25, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. You want to know the fastest way to lose something or for something to be destroyed in your life? Do this. Withhold it from God. The word lose means to destroy, to kill, or to cause to lose. So God's saying if you want to hang on to your life, if you don't want to give your life, if you don't want to give your heart, you're going to lose it. It's going to be destroyed. It's going to, at the end of the day, you're going to cause destruction to it. But, someone say but. But if you give up your life for my sake, the Bible says, you will save it. That word uh, save means uh, to find or to obtain or to enjoy or to recover. So what is this scripture actually saying? Even if what you're giving to the Lord, even if it feels like it's, it's, it's not, may not be valuable to God, but it's valuable to you, God will begin to bring life to it and it will bring restoration to it, bring hope to it. Married couples, maybe you feel like your relationship has been on the rocks and there's no life and you're not enjoying it. Do this, give your marriage to the Lord and you'll begin to enjoy your marriage once again. And God will bring restoration. God will bring life to your marriage. Give what you're holding on to, give it to the Lord and you will see life come of it. The Bible also says this, James 4, oh no, no, look it. It says in it says, James 4, 7, it says, submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. That means there's, there's power in submitting something to the Lord. We have no power to resist temptation when we haven't surrendered our life to the Lord. But there's power when we submit to God and we give him everything. This is the last point here. If we don't have withhold anything from God, we know this. We know this principle is always true. Point number four, God won't withhold from you. God will not withhold anything from you. Lamentations 3.25 says, the Lord is good to those who depend on him. The word depend is, means to hope in. It means to wait patiently for. It means to expect. The Bible is saying here, God is good to those that depend on him. Mm -mm, what a good scripture. You know, I don't see God as just an addition to my life. I need him. I'm dependent on God. I'm not going to live my life trying to just be some Mr. Independent guy. I could do this on my own. I'm good. I got this. No, the reality check is this. Without God, I am no good. Without God, I have nothing to offer. Without God, I can't even stand up here and say anything. Without God, I have no power. Without God, I have no strength. Without God, I can't be a good husband. Without God, I can't do anything of value for my family or for the church or for the ministry. I am 100% fully dependent on God. I am dependent on the Lord. If God ever filed taxes, he's gonna put me on there. I'm his dependent, I need him. I need God. And I'm not afraid to say I am a child of the Lord. I am his son. He is my dad. Everything I need, I can find in his arms. He is a good father and he will withhold no good thing from me. Because why? I depend on him. 
I need him. Is there anybody in here that depends on the Lord? You need him. I need him. I need him. I'm not going to front. I'm not going to stand up here and be like, I'm good. I got this. No, the reality is I need God bad. And you know what's crazy? I don't need God less now because I'm more mature than when I first got saved. I need God just as much today as the very day I was bound in darkness and chains and sin and depression and anxiety and lust and fear. I need God now, even though I could be walking in freedom, I need him to stay free. I need him to live free. I need him to have power as much today as day number one. I need God. Is there anybody that needs Jesus in this place today. I need him. The scripture says, the Lord, go back to Lamentations 3, please. It says, the Lord, the Lord is good to those who depend on him. Which the opposite is probably true. The Lord isn't much good to people that don't really need God. The Bible actually says, Jesus said, I didn't come for those that think themselves righteous. I didn't came for people that think they're good on their own. I didn't come for the people that don't need any saving. I came for the people that are jacked up, messed up, addicted, bound, lost, and need someone to save them. That's who Jesus came for. Someone like me and probably someone like you. I depend on God. God will not let his dependence down. Look at this verse, Psalms 84, 11. It says, the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Mm -mm -mm, Another great scripture. The Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. See, and you want to know what that right thing is talking about there? You may be thinking, man, I messed up this week. I, I kind of fell. I'm not really doing right. You want to know what the right thing to do is just repent. It's just give your heart to God. It's just surrender to him. You know the Bible says a righteous man will fall seven times and get back up. So you want to know the right thing to do if you feel like you've been doing wrong? Is just repent. Give your life to God. Give your mess to God. Confess to the Lord. Surrender your sin to him. That's the right thing to do right now. If you feel like, oh man, I'm disqualified from that verse. No, if you were disqualified when you did wrong, you would have died and been separated from God forever. But because you're still breathing and you can still see me and you can still hear me, the fact is God is saying do something right right now by repenting. Do the right thing surrender do the right thing and be at my feet so the Lord will withhold no good thing from those who do what is right do what's right and you can expect good things from him you know what that word good means that word actually is the word tobe which means good it means pleasing it means desirable it means best It means prosperous. There's prosperity for those who do what is right. It means generous. God will be generous towards those who do what is right. It means joyful. How many need some joy in my day? You can expect that when you do what is right, when you surrender to the Lord. Profitable, wealth, so many good things. The list goes on and on and on of the good things that God has in store for those who do what is right. I want to show you something. I actually found this two weeks ago. I was going through, I was looking for some documents in my house, and it was a letter I wrote to God years ago. It's probably, I wrote this letter probably six, seven years ago, maybe six years ago. I wrote this letter to the Lord. I completely forgot this letter existed. And I wrote this letter to the Lord, and I just found it two weeks ago. I want you to see what it looks like. This is actually the real, the real letter right here. I scanned it. Look at my beautiful handwriting. Um... Don't make fun of me. But could you clear out the text? There's some text on the screen. It says this, Lord, oh, not that one. There we go. Lord, I am asking for all my debt to be wiped out. I'm praying for another house. I'm just believing big. And you want to know, let me, let, me, let me rewind. The reason I wrote this letter is because God prompted me to give the biggest offering I had ever given in my life. It was all of my life savings. I'm not, I'm not saying that's, this is the recipe here. I'm not saying do this, do that. What I'm saying is this. The Holy Spirit gave me instructions and I said, okay, I have to obey. So then, not only did he tell me, give me your treasure. Put it in my hands and trust me with it. Not only did he tell me to do that, but he said, now I want you to write down what you're looking for and what you desire. 
I felt the Holy Spirit tell me that. It was like quick, it was like right before two and I knew it and I knew God was speaking to me and I was gonna give the offering but I stopped, I grabbed a piece of paper and I began writing this thing down and it was everything that I felt like the Lord was leading me to write and I desired and I wrote it down to the Lord. And if you feel like it's selfish to do that, it's not. The Bible says to make your requests be known to God. Let him know what you want. He's a good father. Remember, you're his masterpiece. He loves you more than he loves the mountains. And why would he withhold a good thing from you? He won't. So he prompted me to write this. So I started writing this down. I wrote down, I want, I'm praying for another house. I had a house at this time. And I was like, you know what? I want another one. God, is, God has all the houses in the world. He could give me one of them. Hallelujah. I was praying for my brother at the time he was in LA and I was praying for my brother to find a great job out here in San Bernardino and to grow on fire for Jesus. And then I also prayed for the finances to propose and get married. Rewind, I find this letter two weeks ago to this day, I was able to wipe out all of my debt. I was able to get not just one other house, but two other houses in Jesus' name. My brother ended up finding a great job out here in San Bernardino, hallelujah. I'm still praying for him to be on fire, so pray with me on that one. And the last one, I wanted to propose and get married, and my wife is sitting right up here. My good thing, my treasure, she's sitting right front row. My beautiful wife, she got a ring on her finger, and we got married. God delivered on every promise. He is a good and faithful God, and he will not withhold a good thing from you. See, the reason why I felt like God prompted me to do this is because he was teaching me a lesson. He was illustrating something to me. He showed me this, and I realized afterwards that the money that I had in my savings account, I could have taken care of the majority of the things on this list. And I probably would have been able to do that, and that would have been fine. But God wanted to do abundantly more than I could have ever asked or thought. And God always wants you to do a live in abundance. He doesn't just want to meet you at the minimum requirement. We don't serve a minimum wage God. We don't serve a God who's going to give you the very least. We don't serve a God who's like, oh, no, no overtime for you this week. We serve a God who's going to pour over your cup. Oh, it's going to be some left over on your lap. It's going to be spilling out of your storehouses more than enough for you and for other people. So what, one thing, one principle, and I want you to get this, that God showed me here was this. A seed that is spent only brings addition. I probably could have used my money and covered some of those things. But a seed that's sown brings multiplication. I'll say this principle again. A seed that's spent brings addition. But a seed that's sown in the ground brings multiplication from the Lord. I want to walk in the abundant life that God has for me. And the only way I can see that happen in my life is if I take the things I'm withholding from the Lord and surrender it in his hands and see the seed multiply and multiply in my life. I am not here to tell God what to do for me. I'm here to surrender my life to the Lord and let him reveal it to my life. How many want to see God? God's plan revealed in your life and God's abundant life in your life. So now, I, I, I wrote this down. I just found it. It was, it was amazing because I didn't realize that, that in this season, we would have this. This is a, a, this is a gift for him. But what I want to talk about in this envelope in particular is on the inside flap. I want to make sure that everybody has one of these when you leave. But one thing I want to focus on is a little box in there that says, my Christmas prayer request. I want to make sure that everybody, when you turn this in, you fill that box out. Write down something on your heart that you can expect from your good God. He's faithful. He will not withhold good from you. He loves you. The reason why we give, obviously, is to love other people, to make a way for people to come to know Jesus. But one of the blessings attached to giving is that God meets all of your needs and does good things in your life. This box here is massively important. And I want you to pray. And I want you to fill it out. Maybe that box is too small for you. And you need a big letter like I did. Man, I was like, God... I'm giving everything, so I'm going to fill up a page, Lord. And I did, but God is so good, and he's so faithful. And I believe this, when we give God our best, when we give God our lives, he will withhold no good thing from you. 
trust that God, he's faithful, he's loving, and he's merciful. And I want to share one last scripture. The worship team can come out. Romans 5, 8 says this. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. The last point is this. God didn't withhold his sacrifice from you. And what was his sacrifice? It was Jesus Christ. Can you believe that God didn't even withhold his own son so that you can have eternal life? Just imagine the pain of a father to give up his one and only son. At this time, he only has his son, Jesus. Jesus is perfect. The son and the father have existed in eternity, all of eternity, all of time backwards. They've always existed together. There was coming a day where he would finally send his son Jesus down to this earth and not withhold him so that you and I can have a relationship with him. I want you to close your eyes wherever you're at. Nobody else moving, please. Just stay in your seat. I want to ask you this question. Where is your heart? Where is your treasure? Where is your life? Is it in the hands of God? Today I believe God is knocking at the heart, at the door of your heart. And he's saying, will you let me in? You know what's so beautiful about this scripture is that God didn't wait for you to get right to give you his best. He didn't wait for you to clean up or to get rid of your addiction. The Bible says here, while you were still sinners, he sent his son Jesus to die for you. So my question to you is this, for those in here today that are saying, I'm done withholding my heart from God. I'm done holding on to my own lifestyle. The reality is that when we hold on to our lives, we are not saved. You are not saved in your own hands. But I'm a good person. You are not saved because you're a good person. But I came to church today. You are not saved because you checked in at church. But I go to church every week. I didn't miss not one Sunday. You are not saved because you're a member of the Wayworld Outreach. You are not saved because of that. The only way for a man to be saved is to give his life to Jesus. The Bible says, repent of your sins. Confess Christ as Lord. You will be saved. Today, don't withhold your life from God. Don't withhold, don't withhold your addiction. Don't withhold your sin. Don't withhold your heart from him. Give him everything. I want to ask you today, if you're ready to surrender everything, and today you want to be saved, and today you want a relationship with Jesus Christ, and you want to receive the goodness of God, not just the blessings and all the great things, but you want to be saved and receive eternal life from the Lord, and you're saying, I'm done fighting God, and I'm ready to surrender. When I count to three, I want you to raise your hand if you're saying, that's me. I'm giving my heart to Jesus today. One, two, three. Raise your hands all over this place. I see all those four or five hands. Six, seven, eight, nine hands. Ten. I see 11, 12. There's so many hands going up. I see your hands. I see your hands. I see your hands back there. Anybody else? Keep your hands up. You're saying, that's me. I see you guys. I see you guys. I see you guys to my right. I'm proud of you. Anybody to my left? I see you guys over here. I see you. Can you do me one more favor? For those that raise your hands, I want you to do something today. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to bring you up on the mic or tell you to say anything at all. I want you to do something. I want you to stand right now at your feet. Just stand up where, right where you're at, from the front row to all the way to the back row. Just stand up. You're saying, I'm giving my life to Jesus today. Make a public decoration today. Come on, let's give him a round of applause. Why don't we do this? Let's give them a standing ovation. Everybody that's making a decision to give their life to Jesus. Come on, let's get excited. Let's get pumped up. Let's get excited for those that are giving their life to Jesus. One more thing. If you raise your hand, could you do me one more favor? Could you come out of your seat? Could you come forward to the front real quick? We want to pray with you. And we want to congratulate you. 
and we want to give you resources and tools that are going to help you. If you raise your hand, do me a favor. Right now, just make your way out of your seat. Come forward to the front. Even if you were in the back row, come to the front. Come on, church. Let's clap. Let's encourage them. Let's get excited for them. This is a big moment in their life. Come on. Let's sing it. Let's get excited. Come on, they're still coming, they're still coming, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Look at that, families are coming forward. Amen. Okay, everybody who came up here, just look at me for a second. God has a plan for your life. And the greatest thing you could ever have in life He's knocking on your heart's door right now. He's meeting you right here. His name is Jesus. He's gonna do something new in your life that you've never seen before. Get ready. I want everyone to bow your heads and close your eyes. I want you to repeat this prayer after me. Say, Jesus, thank you for going to the cross on my behalf. You took nails in your hands, a crown of thorns on your head, lashes on your back, in my place. You didn't deserve it. I did, but you did it for me. So I repent from my wrong living. Forgive me of my sin. I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. From this moment forward, I belong to you. I believe you died on the cross and you rose from the dead so that I can be saved. From this moment forward, my life belongs to you and I'll never be the same again. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me and setting me free. In Jesus' name I pray and we all say amen, amen, amen. Let's give God praise for how good and how faithful and how loving he is. Church, we love you. Remember. God has good for you. You're his masterpiece. Don't forget it. And don't withhold any good thing from the Lord. We love you. Next week we'll be here. Let's pray about the treasure that we want to put in the hands of God. Let's be ready. Get your red envelopes. If you need one, one of our ushers at the door or in the aisle, they'll have a red envelope for you. Or you can find one in our foyer. God bless you. We love you. If you need prayer, come forward. Pastor Marco is going to be preaching Wednesday. So show up. It's going to be powerful. And next Sunday he's going to be preaching. So we love you. God bless you. God is for you. There's no one who can come against you. God bless. Have a wonderful Sunday. Hey, everybody. We just got one last message for you real quick before you get off today. We wanted to say we love you. You're amazing. And uh, what an incredible service, huh, Allegra? That was amazing. Yes, it was a great service. Great word today. Yes. I think it touched, it definitely touched my heart. So I'm so glad that I'm here. <laughs> Yes. And we're, we're glad that you guys came to service today. Yes, and every single one of you guys, we're going into the Christmas season. We are going into a time to celebrate Jesus, who is the reason for Christmas. And actually, our church isn't just a church that has amazing word, great leadership. If you're in this house, you are blessed. But above and beyond that, we actually have provided something for you for the first time as a special surprise for the Christmas holidays. Talk to us about that later. Yes, so this Christmas season, we have two Christmas singles being released mm. next week. Yeah. So stay tuned. We're going to um, put a link. Uh, what is it called? The QR yeah, code. QR code. It's going to be right here as you guys are watching. Right there, literally. And I wish I could kind of just touch, but I can't, you know. But it's on Somewhere the screen right, right now. Yeah. And it's a QR code. You'll be able to pre-order that Christmas. So what are the two songs? Yes. Yeah, so we're doing Silent Night, which is an original version of that song. Yeah, sounds very and different. And then we're also doing Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas. Mm, we do so want to have a Merry Christmas. We did do these songs last year for our online service on Christmas Day, but we never released them. So this time we're going to release them as a gift for you guys and for your families. Yes, and above that, last thing, this is so incredible. We are a church who is a worship church. Pastor Marco has talked multiple times about how this church will have albums going out, songs sang all over the world from churches all over the world. So we have a special thing that's also coming up because we all know in January we do our 21-day fast. When the 21-day fast happened, we're listening to worship already on YouTube, right? We have worship playlists. A lot of us aren't able to watch anything else. So <laughs> we're watching preaching or worship, and that's the right way to do a fast. But we're going to be providing something else for you for a 21-day fast. Talk yes. about that. So we also have been spending this year praying 
and we wrote a prayer album. It's called The Prayer Closet, yes. and we're going to release it next year for our fast. And this is what we're going to be listening to while we're fasting and praying Ooh, all for original this next songs, year. right? All original songs. Wow. So these were songs that were literally gotten in the cradle of prayer, in the times of prayer, birthed out of that time from our worship team all together. I know that on certain nights there are multiple people that are in the studio. They're writing. They're doing this for you to have an experience with God. When you fast, remember, fasting is not fasting if you're just not eating. Fasting is fasting when you do it with prayer. So don't just not eat. That's just called starving. But when you fast, you want to be praying for the times you normally were eating, okay? And you can put on this worship, and it can change your life. Y'all, we love you so much. Thank you again for tuning in for our service. Tell somebody about it because you are part of our church. You're the online church, but you're part of us. We pray that the presence of God is infiltrated. Pastor Christian said an amazing word today, and we're praising that it really, really touched you. God bless you today. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. We'll talk to you soon.